Hello. Good morning. Hey, you made it. Let's go. That's good. Uh, what time did you get to sleep yesterday evening? Anyone after midnight? Raise your hand, please. OK, after 1 AM? Keep your raise. 2 AM? 3? Uh, 4? Oh, you are survivors down there. Yeah, no, great, great, great. Um, so I'm glad you made it. Uh, on my account, I went to sleep very early yesterday evening, 10, 30, 11. Uh, but then this morning, I woke up at 5 uh, after a dream where my keynote crashed, and my presentation was gone, and I had to wing it um, without any visual uh, backing it. And it was painful. It felt like when I was dreaming about math exams in high school sort of thing. Like if, was really, really painful. Um, so uh, let's introduce my talk after thanking the, speaker, the, the sponsors and the organizers here. Um, so when I started thinking about this talk, um, I had modularity in mind. Like, um, and particularly, I had in mind I wanted to talk about modular architectures. Um, modular architectures are something that always fascinated me, and the web became um, reasonably recently in its history. Um, exposed to this kind of um, approach. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realized in my mind what I really wanted to talk about. Uh, it went down to classes and components, which is very far from the modern architecture initial thing, right? Like what I was working every day in my um, work was actually working with components and applying classes to it. And, and in the end, like it was more about components and modifiers, really. Um, and then like, I tried to pin down what exactly I really wanted to talk about. And it was components, modifier, and overrides. Because most of the time I spent, um, well, after I designed the initial component, most of the time I spent time creating variants of what I was there already in my uh, pattern library. Uh, but this is not a title that is very catchy. So I went for this one. It's components, pattern, shit, it's hard to deal with. Uh, it's not very polite, but I think it, like, it has something, right? Um, anyway, uh, I'm Marco Cedro. Uh, you can find me as Chad Max every, everywhere, pretty much on the internet. Uh, I was a webmaster way before it was cool. Uh, and right now, I, I'm Italian. I live in London, and I work for a company that's called uh, Condonast International. You might know it as the publisher of Vogue, GQ, uh, Wired, um, Vanity Fair, and other uh, magazines. So if in the break you want to talk not just about that, but also about fashion, Please don't. Um, look at me, come on. Um, anyway, this is my talk, component, shit and, um, component patterns and shit is hard to deal with. And I'm very proud, though, of the tagline, which is how I came up with good use of quotes from Lost in Translation. Uh, did anyone see the movie Lost in Translation? Could you raise your hand, please? OK, just a few, just a few. So for the people that doesn't know what Lost in Translation is, uh, is a movie. Is Allegedly, a very good movie with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. Uh, Bill Murray is um, a seasoned actor um, and is uh, traveling to Japan to shoot a commercial. Scarlett Johansson uh, is a young woman in her 20s. She is trying to figure out what to do with her life. And she is traveling to Japan because she is accompanying, like, she is going with her partner, who is a um, fashion photographer. You see, fashion comes back in my life. Uh, anyway, uh, so they meet. Uh, while the photographer is taking the photo shoot and, is, um, and Bill Murray is off uh, the, the shooting of the commercial. And they start this non-romantic relationship where they try to sort out their, each other's problems sort of thing. So one is going through a middle age crisis, the other one is trying to figure out what to do with their life. And they become the a support group of two people that kind of spends a week together and uh, make sense of their unknowns, I, I guess. Uh, again, I said allegedly good because this is one of the reactions that this movie triggered, and a lot of people, me included, I don't know about the people that saw it, but um, it's a very weird movie. Uh, it's, again, it's, it's very good. The actors are good. Uh, the director, um, uh, Sofia Coppola, is very good. Um, it just left me with this bittersweet sort of taste uh, on the back of my mouth, like, what the hell did I just watch? And while I hope my talk is not giving you the same sense, it might. Uh, because I have no answer. Like, I'm not proposing a solution for any other problem I'm creating <laughs> for you in this talk. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out with you um, whether the concerns I have in the way I've been building uh, patterns and components in the last few years is something that you can resemble in your code base and you can maybe think ways of doing it differently if 
the problems I found applies to your case. Um, the true reason, though, why I use loss in translation is because um, a while ago, Ala Kolmatova, speaking about design patterns in the design domain, um, made this sentence during a talk, meaning is complex and often gets lost in translation. Everybody has their own mental model of things. And I think this is one of the main problems that we face when we talk about modularity and components, and we have to interface with a design pattern that comes from another department or with designers that work together, um, but in an isolated space from us. Um, so again, she was talking about design specifically, but I think the concept of Lego components together and create things it, uh, does apply to us uh, quite a bit. Uh, just one last word about me. So when I said um, it was, I, I, I'm a webmaster before it was cool, I meant that I started my career uh, 15 years and 25 kilograms ago. <laughs> and, and I've seen and again, it's not to, to brag about my seniority or anything like that, because I'm not that good at coding anyway. Uh, it's more to um, present the fact that, uh, being an old fart, I've seen a lot of things changing over the course of the years. And um, most of the changes I've seen were uh, affecting users directly, more than us as developers. Well, they, they surely affected us, but they were revolutionary for users first. So if you think about in JavaScript, uh, when it was uh, when it became a thing after the first browser wars, uh, it meant that people would have uh, advanced interaction without having to install plugins, which was a beautiful thing for users, right? Uh, I don't know, uh, the responsiveness meant they could use any device without having to go to a different website and have less features of less content and things like that. So this is all user-facing things. Modularity instead is very much about us, about how we build things. Like the user ideally wouldn't have any difference in how the experience is uh, a service or a SPA or a website based on the fact that you built it with modules, components, or if you don't. Uh, it might be a little more consistent across, but uh, like in theory, the, the experience the user has is no different. Um, and this brings me to uh, the period of my life in between 2013 and 2015. Um, so I used to work at Shazam uh, back then, the music app. Yes, they do have a website as well. Um, and we had a project that was basically from scratch. Uh, it was mobile first, because in 2013 it was the thing. Uh, and what we focused as a front-end team was to um, build it in a modular and scalable way. Uh, we didn't have any fancy technology back then. Well. Uh, Angular was already out there. I think React was on the verge of being released. But we went for something way more uh, old school. Uh, so we used Mustache to, ser to server render our content. We used uh, BAM in our CSS to maintain the, the, the isolation of components. And we wrote our own uh, JavaScript um, small uh, library uh, to deal with the life cycle of our widgets and things. Uh, and this was on the back of the work that um, Brad Frost um, theorized in 2013, uh, word about atomic design to that extent, like atoms, molecules, organisms. Um, so Brad Frost was they released this article back then, uh, where he theorized um, this way of breaking down design um, to start from, again, the page that you get from the designer, and then thinking about what's the template, what is the, 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 the common thing you can reuse to build the template, and then breaking down every single element, like uh, an organism is the header, and then the header as, I don't know, uh, a drop-down menu, which is a molecule, and every single item in this thing is an atom. Like, you can see the pattern here, right? It's what we do with React all the time. Um, but yeah, like, it, it started there to an extent for us. Uh, but if I look at the history of it, it was before that. Like we were eager to have a modular and a componentized web before that. Like web components um, were announced in 2011, and w since then we were like, yes, please. Um, but it goes even beyond. Like this, the Anna Debenham, and I think it, this this talk was from 2014. I might be wrong, but she said that in a more designy world, but still in the web industry, she saw uh, using the, a design pattern approach back in 2009. So we're going back, and if you think about um, uh, printed design, that goes way back, way before uh, our industry was mature enough to embrace the modular architectures. Um, 
so I mentioned pattern libra libraries quite a few times now, and I just want to, um, since meaning is lost in translation often, I just wanted to um, talk about what I mean by pattern libraries. Uh, again, like this could be a talk on its own, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Uh, but by pattern libraries, I mean a codified dictionary that the designers worked out uh, about your SPA product brand even, uh, and that is reflected in your code. Um, how much your code adheres to these pattern libraries to be discussed, but my, my, I, I'm focusing more on the design language rather than uh, storybook or um, style guides that were presented yesterday. So this is, again, this is a codified dictionary where every visual element that is appearing in your website, in your uh, SPA, is uh, codified and, and is isolated with all the different states. And again, it could be reflected in code, um, and that's for the best, probably. Um, so again, this was um, where we got at. Um, I think like I, my, I, I tried to go to build my way back in 2009. Feels like it's the first time uh, I've heard about it, at least. Uh, but then we got it. Like 2013, React came out. It was the very first thing that actually helped us breaking down things in a way that was scalable. Like we could actually reuse our components in an easy ma manner without getting crazy about it. Um, so where we are now today, five years later. Um, so again, I gave this. I started writing this talk because I thought we had an issue, and by we I meant me. Um, because when you're trying to apply a modern approach in your day-to-day -day work, it, is re it isn't really that simple. And the issue I felt like in the last few years is that sometimes I get to this uh, situation where you're trying to fit a square in a circle sort of thing. You're trying to apply uh, patterns in a way they're not meant to be, or you're trying to stand your patterns in a way that um, they weren't built for, and you end up with a lot of exceptions and weird overrides and things like that. So my issue in my mind was, how do we manage in our code to reuse patterns without making them too rigid for the day-to-day -day activities? So we take the design library, um, the design patterns, we try to write them down in code, and then all of a sudden we get a change, uh, a different use case, or uh, a set of functionality we didn't expect. What do we do then? That, um, how do we reuse our patterns in slightly different use case? And here comes the first quote. Uh, and again, it's been a problem throughout the last few years for me. Again, maybe it's not for you. Uh, and this talk, even though there are, um, I, I decided to, to give a talk with real code. So the, the code you see now on is, is all code that has been running in production in a, in the company, in a company I was working before. Uh, so th this talk is not specifically about React itself. Um, so again, the, the, the talk is going to be React with some BAM. Uh, but you can have the same approaches and the same uh, paradigms using style components, CSS modules. Uh, you can do the same stuff in Vue. Uh, it's not about that. It's about how you think about your modular architecture and how you think about your components and their responsibilities and where to find stuff. So the thing that, find, that I found is a way to deal with exceptions uh, in components. And I've seen also quite a few articles and, and talks where this was ad advocated for, is the what I call class name injection. Um, and by that, I mean like you have a, an icon button and you inject the class names with some over there, overrides. Uh, so this is very troubling to me. It might just work fine, but in my opinion, is 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 a problem. And I'm going to explain why. So this is the content action uh, where the override lives. And we get some CSS that applies in isolation on a component that already exists elsewhere. Uh, and we don't really, like looking at this file, we don't really know what's happening. Like we don't know what the base style of the button is. Uh, on top of that, for me, like why is this button, why does this button have different colors from the original button? Like what, in a design pattern, like in a, in a world where all my design is codified already, why this button specifically have a different color? It doesn't make any sense to me uh, if I think semantically about buttons in my application. Um, so like, again, it's definitely the most flexible way to extend anything. Like, you, if you can inject a class, you can override everything. The problem to me is that the default style could be overridden in unexpected ways. So if you were to change this, the original button, how do you know your application is still working across the board? Like, how do you know there isn't a button that started misbehaving because 
it was relying on certain styles being on the base button. Um, and also, again, on a design pattern, codified language, design language, where does that fit? Um, how many variants do we have of the, of the button? How many overrides? Where do they live? Um, so again, this has pros and cons, as everything. Um, I f again, I find it very troubling uh, that to be a best practice. I don't know what you think about it. Does anyone use this class injection sort of approach to override components? OK, a few. Good. Um, we can talk about that afterward if you want. Like, if you don't agree, just feel free to grab me and have a chat about it. I, I'm not, I, I don't have answers, as I said. I just have um, approaches and, and pros and cons. Um, another way to deal with exceptions is uh, ad hoc modifiers. Uh, by ad hoc modifiers, it means that they're not generally used modifiers, but modifiers based on a very specific instance of what you need to build. So let's take a dialog, for example. Um, you have very different dialogs in your website. Some are alerts, some are others are um, for other purposes. So this one specifically was to collect user intents, so it was a form within a dialog. Uh, and we had this class name, which is pretty specific to the use case. Uh, the CSS, again, changes not much, but it's quite uh, clear. It lives within the file of the other dialogues, which is good, because you, you have the base component at the top, and then you have the extension. My problem with it is that it could grow in an in indefinite way. Like, you have, it could have a lot of variants. And again, this is a real code, like you've seen uh, that. So that, that means that when you load the dialog, whenever in your website, you load this CSS, even though you're not using any of it, unless you kind of take away the unused bits, which could be um, difficult sometimes. Um, so again, it's a practice that gives a lot of flexibility, reasonable control, because everything is in proximity. Um, so that's, that's not too bad. The problem is, again, um, every single component that is extended this way knows about every other variant. And the file size might be affected. You might load a lot of CSS that is not really needed. And it doesn't quite scale, because you could have a lot of different and diverse uh, variants that are not really um, used everywhere. Maybe you have one dialog in one place, very remote in the website, and the whole website is loading the same CSS anyway. Specialized patterns is what proper modifiers in BAM are for. And this is probably the easiest way to deal with, with this kind of thing. So um, it goes back to, to, to thinking hard what you need to do uh, and planning more, maybe. Uh, so you have a generic uh, class. It's, it, it looks pretty much the same of the previous one, with the difference that semantically this is very different because it's a reusable component, it's a reusable modifier. Um, the patterns are, like, you bring the design patterns back at the center of your development, which is good. You're not creating special cases, but you have predefined uh, modifiers, predefined flavors of your basic components. Um, the only problem with it is that it could drive preemptive abstraction. You could start seeing patterns where there really aren't any. Uh, you can start creating all of these variants that are used maybe once, and, and then they die. Um, and again, it's, like, it's quite limited. Like You can have a few, but not many. Um, again, this, this in, React, in a React world, it would probably go on down the line of the last two instead of being class name injection, really. Uh, but you see the, the, the way here to, to deal with it, uh, I think. Um, so again, there are, like, going back and, s and looking at what we just looked like, these are common practices I've seen. Um, Again, in my career, there might be way more ways to deal with it. Uh, and I, I find them, all of them have pros and cons. I think the last one is probably the least flexible, but more um, sustainable on the long term. Um, but when I got here, I felt like I was completely stuck. And I wasn't really um, n pinning down what was bothering me. Um, because it isn't simple. It's not. It's not a simple problem to solve. So like, I went back to uh, the, the drawing board, and I got back thinking about the problem I put myself uh, onto, like how do we use our patterns uh, in, a different, in different use cases. And I asked myself, what is, what is that I'm really trying to solve? Like, Why do we do that? Rather than focusing on how we dealt with the, um, uh, with 
overriding patterns and components, uh, I decided to look at why am I doing it? What, what, what is the use case when I need to do that? So I, I noticed that one of the things that happened most often, in, at least in that code base, was that we needed to arrange um, components on positioning components within their parents. That was a very common reason why we injected class names with a different uh, prefix or, or things like that, because we wanted the external container to own the positioning of the children. Um, so again, this could be another way to deal with it, right? Like you could wrap, um, you, you could have a normal dialogue. The dialogue is flexible uh, to to um, to its container, and then the wrapper knows about the positioning and the margins and etc. So every component has their own responsibilities. Everything is kind of sandbox. The dialogue is very very flexible and only the parent container knows about it. So it's neat, it's, it's good. Uh, it enables for specific implementation without invalidating patterns, uh, even though, again, in a design pattern world, you might want to check what the specific, uh, specific implementation are for. But in general, like, it's, not, it's not too bad. Um, again, like the, there is a problem. Uh, we all saw it in, in React many times. Like You end up bloating your HTML with wrappers, and you have the explosion of divs that are everywhere. But from a semantic perspective, it's great. Um, so again, there's another option. Um, another thing, and again, this is close to um, the previous one, is just that is a relation between um, other components and not within positioning within the parent component. Um, and again, th there are solutions for this, and you might like them or not, but if you define spaces in your design uh, pattern library, you could have generic and specific um, spacing that could be applied to any component. Um, again, I'm doing here with class names, which I argued before that shouldn't be done, but just to, to, to make sense of it, you could have like definition of the spacing um, around. And it's great for some reasons. Um, you don't, need, you don't need to name things at first, which is good. As Sarah mentioned yesterday, naming things is very hard, and sometimes it's kind of pointless. Uh, you end up with a lot of different buttons for no reason. Um, and again, you, you move the conversation to a higher level where you define the relationship within the components that are in your design domain at a higher level where you define relationships, which is great because most pattern libraries they define the lower level, the leaf components, but they never think about how they relate to each other, and that's where you start introducing a lot of uh, quirks to make them work nice together. Um, the positional classes could get stale uh, if they're not properly codified, so that step to be done at the design level is important. Um, the flexibility for those classes is limited unless you um, want to bloat your code with a lot of them. And to me, it looks a lot like uh, Atomic CSS. Uh, did, do anyone, uh, did you hear about Atomic CSS? It was, okay, so Atomic CSS is very good for um, CSS size because you can reuse very granular and small uh, class names to apply a whole different range of uh, generic helpers and again, spacing, pad margin padding and as such is quite ugly for me as a developer to use, but again, that's my personal perspective, so if you are looking into this thing, it might be something you want to explore. Um, the last way, uh, the, the last reason why I think in my career, like the last three to four years, uh, I built components that uh, needed exception is because what I really wanted was to have flexible components, open components. And a way around that is to actually expose um, things to change those components. So in this case specifically, like this is an icon that gets overridden within um, within a question content block, and it changes width and height of the icon. But you could argue that you could rewrite this thing in a way that the question content block doesn't have to know about the icon itself or the icon namespace or whatever. So the icon C as CSS would expose a way to um, extend certain properties without the 
content block knowing them um, or knowing how to apply them. And again, this is pretty good in terms of um, responsibility because the icon CSS defines what's what can get changed. And again, this is a pattern that you see often in uh, style components, for example. Like you have exactly the same thing. Like you define a component, and with the props, you change the style. Um, again, in React World, you would probably go for something like this, uh, which is great, right? You have an icon that takes the size as a prop, and you apply it. Um, so every base component can be as flexible as it defines to be. Uh, and developers have control of what they expose, which is amazing. Of course, it comes with a cost. Uh, this technique involves um, thinking about the base, co base component in a way more detailed way. You, you need to think about what you want to expose and why and how it fits in the pattern library in, in the design. And, and it's a slippery slope, because if you start exposing everything, you end up having no control whatsoever on the component. So as long as it's a few properties and a few things, then yes, it works just fine. But when it comes to... Uh, small uh, components that have like six, seven, eight props just to change style and create combination of those. Again, how does it fit in a codified design world? Um, so like, did we solve this problem? Does it get easier with training and, and working around it? Um, and I want to use the movie to answer that. Does it get easier? No. Yes. It gets easier. No, oh, yeah. Look at you. Thanks. <laughs> the more you know who you are and what you want, the less you let things upset you. Yeah. So the more you know who you are and what you want, the less um, you get things upset you. Um, I think that's the core part of my talk uh, to an extent. Um, so Scarlett Johnson said, I just don't know what I'm supposed to be. And I think this is the main uh, reason why I ended up um, writing components that were not really what I needed. And it's like the main problem I found is that um, when you talk with designers, when you talk with product owners, when you talk with uh, the rest of the broader team that you work with, um, sometimes there isn't a common language. Sometimes we refer to the same things with slightly different uh, naming conventions. And um, sometimes this leads to a lot of confusion around things. And so when you speak with the business about parts of your, your website or your web app with a technical language, they don't really understand what you're talking about. And that's true the other way around. So I think like, th there is a step we need to do as developers to, to reach out and try to understand and convey the, the meaning and the reasons of why we're adding an exceptions and why we, are, um, we have to deal with it. Um, so I, I, again, I don't know how close you work with your designer in your company or if you get given a uh, deliverable and you have to build on top of it. But I think it's, it's fairly important uh, to learn uh, what we are doing and why we are doing it, rather than just um, taking a design and building it. Uh, we should be involved way earlier in the process when possible uh, and try to discuss and um, interact with the designer early. Um, and we need to learn to talk to people. I don't know how many of you spend their time, but what, what's the balance between coding and actually talking to people, but I think it's uh, fairly important we understand the domain we're working on, we understand why we're doing things rather than just do them. Um, and the message, the main message of the movie is that in the end, you're not hopeless. So that was me. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No? Thank you, Marco.